Thanks, Jack. Lots of exciting stuff happening there. It's very good to hear. Come to our Bible readings now, and our first Bible reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armour-bearer, Come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gebeah, under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other Senna. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash and the other to the south towards Geba. Jonathan said to his young armour bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armour bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armour bearer, come up to us, we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armour bearer, climb up after me, the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armour bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armour bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armour bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A second reading will be brought to us by Jennifer. The New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 23 verses 12 to 22. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander he has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it that you want to tell me? He said, some of the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everybody. It is uh, it's really lovely to be with you again. 
another beautiful day here in Gippsland. Had a lovely drive out from Melbourne this morning. Uh, so great to be with you uh, and to spend some time uh, continuing thinking with you about youth ministry and these uh, two sermons, time to coincide, well, timed by God's uh, sovereignty, but time to coincide with Jack's appointment as uh, youth minister in this parish. Let me say I was able to spend some time with Jack last week uh, over lunch and just so encouraged to hear his plans for the youth ministry here, but, but more than that, his heart for this ministry. So uh, uh, it's really, it's really a, a pleasure to continue thinking about uh, youth ministry uh, here at, uh, at Warrigal. Last week we asked the question, who will tell our children's grandchildren about Jesus? And the invitation from Psalm 78 is that we would take up this, well, this privilege of being part of this intergenerational faith uh, uh, transmission, sort of this great relay race of uh, receiving from our ancestors, handing on to the next generation that they might hand on to the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. Well, this week I want to ask another question. And the question this week is, but what have teenagers ever done for us? <laughs> what is the gift? Is there a gift of adolescence? Now, perhaps to preempt the conclusion to the sermon, I do want to answer that question uh, very quickly and say, well, what have teenagers ever done for us? Well, they've enabled online church. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Tell and Noah up the back here. I understand that they've spent a fair bit of time uh, uh, through lockdown and even before uh, working the tech set up. Look, I reckon across the world, <clears throat> as churches have moved to online services through the pandemic, I call it the revenge of the gamers. <laughs> that there's, there's been all these teenagers that have been spending all these hours in their bedrooms, uh, you know, on their computers, and their parents saying, get outside, do something useful, and now it's, please, please, can you come and show us how to do all this? <laughs> I want to say a big thanks uh, to you guys. Uh, and to everyone else who has helped uh, put these services online, uh, even though we are looking forward to never having to do this again, um, uh, and uh, really excited for you guys that you get to be in person next week. You know, to be frank, though, <clears throat> uh, teenagers and their contribution hasn't always been welcomed uh, in the church. It can seem that, like, every congregation wants to have more young people provided they don't make any noise, uh, provided they don't cause any problems, and provided it doesn't require any change. <laughs> if those all things are... Then please uh, bring the teenagers in. Now, of course, it's not just the church that has had these sort of antagonistic views of young people, and it's not just today that people have had antagonistic views of young people. Perhaps you've heard these quotes before. Aristotle, speaking in the 4th century BC, says, when I look at the younger generation, I despair for the future of civilization." There was a, uh, a, a church leader called Peter the Hermit in the 12th century. He says this, "'Youth has no regard for old age, and the wisdom of the centuries is looked down on both as stupidity and foolishness.'" The young men are indolent, that means they're lazy. <laughs> the young women are indecent and indecorous in the speech, behaviour and dress. And then Shakespeare in the 17th century, uh, in his play A Winter's Tale, there's a, a shepherd that comes out and he says, I would that there were no age between 16 and 3 and 20 or that youth would sleep out the rest. For there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancientry, stealing and fighting. <laughs> There's been a long tradition, a long history of uh, adults looking down on young people. And you could add the Bible even to that list. Proverbs 22 verse 15. Foolishness is bound to the heart of the youth. A rod of discipline will separate it from him. <laughs> Foolishness is bound to the heart of the youth. And perhaps there's no better illustration of that idea than the story in 1 Kings chapter 12 of King Solomon's son, Rehoboam. 
Uh, Solomon has died and his son Rehoboam comes uh, to the throne of Israel. And he's trying to work out how he should govern, what sort of uh, rule should he have. And so he calls in the elders, the, the old men who have, who have advised his father, and the old men give him the advice. They say, treat the people kindly and they will love you and they will serve you forever. 1 Kings 12 verse 8 says, But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and instead consulted the young men who had grown up with him. Rehoboam consults the young men and they say, the elders say treat these people kindly, we say show them who's boss. (laughs) And that's what Rehoboam does. And as a result, Israel is torn in two, thrown into civil war. It's a disaster. It is foolishness bound to the heart of Israel. Youth. No wonder Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee the evil desires of youth. There's a problem here, isn't it? Much of youth ministry history, actually, in the church in the West, could be summed up as seeing youth as a problem that needs fixing. You go back to the very beginning, probably the first organised youth ministry is the Sunday school movement started in the 18th century by a guy called Robert Rakes in Gloucester in the UK. Uh, He looked around and, you know, sort of Industrial Revolution England and there were all these uh, young people who were working in factories seven days a week but they weren't allowed to work on... six days a week, weren't allowed to work on Sunday but instead of coming to church, the young people were running riot around the town and it was terrible because all the all the good people of Gloucester are coming to church and meanwhile their property is getting destroyed and their young people causing noise outside here's a problem and it needs fixing what better way to fix this problem than by putting those young people into school Sunday school and they learnt maths and English and the Bible In the Gloucester Journal, which is Robert Rakes' newspaper, he wrote in 1783, he's established Sunday schools for rendering the Lord's Day subservient to the ends of instruction because the Lord's Day has hitherto been prostituted to bad purposes. (laughs) Let's keep the young people under control. That's the solution. But is youthfulness really a problem? That needs fixing. Well, I want to say at least no, not in our first Bible reading, and in fact quite the opposite. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, we hear this next instalment in the the conflict between God's people and the the Philistines. It's been been uh, an abject failure up to this point, let's say. At the end of chapter 13... We read that Saul has so mismanaged Israel that the only people... So uh, verse uh, 22 says, On the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. That's, That's a disaster. The king of Israel and his son, they're the only ones with weapons. Everybody else in the army... Well, they're just making do with sticks. So we have this story of Saul's failure, and in the midst of that then comes this story of Jonathan, the king's son, and his young armour-bearer. Now, we don't exactly know how old Jonathan is. He's in the army, so he would, would have been at least 20 years old. But he is clearly the younger generation in this story, the son of the king. And his armour-bearer, clearly described as a young man, again, we don't know exactly his age, but perhaps late teens. What I love about this story, in verses 6 and 7, these two features, enduring features of youthfulness. Jonathan says, perhaps the Lord will act. He hasn't had some vision from the Lord, that has given him clear instructions and it's not just obedience it's it's youthful optimism 
It, it's no, not just optimism. It is youthful confidence. It's, it's, a, it's a trust in God's goodness and overwhelming prevailing purpose. Even in the absence of a specific instruction, perhaps God will act. We don't need lots. God can save by many or by few. So let's give it a shot. <laughs> and then the bit that I really love is then when his young armor bearer turns to him and says, Jonathan, I am with you heart and soul. And you can almost hear his mother in the background saying, if Jonathan was to jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge with him? And of course, the young armor bearer is going to say, of course I would. <laughs> He's my friend. These two features of youthfulness, bold risk taking, peer solidarity, things that these days we know are related to uh, different sort of changes that are happening in the adolescent brain as it develops. But these features of youthfulness God uses in his purpose. And God uses these young people as young people to overcome the foolishness of adults. In our second reading is, is another uh, type of story. And here again, a young person is critical, although so easily overlooked. Have you ever thought about the significance of Saul's nephew, the Apostle Paul, his nephew, in one sense, the linchpin of the entire Christian church? There is a plot to kill and mur to, to murder Paul, and it's the nephew who overhears this. I wonder whether the nephew overheard this because the conspirators are talking away and plotting and they just ignore the young person, the child that's wandering around. Again, we don't know how young this young man is, but it does say the commander takes him by the hand and so that's got the implication that this, this uh, uh, young man is still a boy. But he has courage to speak. And without his speaking, without his hearing and without his speaking, well, the New Testament and the church would be very different to what we know now. My point in this is not to say that young people will save the world. Remember how we concluded last week? It's not young people that's the future of the church. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But... In what God is doing to save the world through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is pleased to use young people as part of that plan. And not just to use the precocious young people who are able to, to act like adults, God is pleased to use young people as young people, bringing all that God has given them and using that in the service of God and his kingdom. So here is my question. What story drives your engagement with young people? Do we approach youth, youthfulness, young people, as a problem that needs to be fixed? As we mentioned earlier. Now, no doubt there are problems associated with adolescence. Adolescence, the word means to, to grow or to change. And, and learning that, that change is, well, there are things to learn. There are pitfalls to fall into. There are, there are evil desires of youth to flee from. And yes, therefore, the church needs adults who will love young people enough to set boundaries on their behaviour. Adults who will love young people enough to call them to account. It is often the case that young people will push and push and push against boundaries. But it's a mistake to think that therefore what a loving adult needs to do is to continue to give way because what young people tend to be doing is pushing against a boundary to find somebody who would love them enough to say, here is where you need to stop. After all, somebody who says, you know, can I play with sharp knives and, and run on the freeway, uh, the adults around them that say, sure, go ahead, they're the ones who, well, they don't care. The church needs adults who love young people to rebuke them, to correct them, to protect them, 
in the name of Christ. So yes, there are problems, there are challenges, problems to fix, challenges to be met, but that's far from the whole story. It's no good ignoring the problems and the challenges that are truly part of the adolescent experience, but don't let the problems and challenges blind us to the opportunities that exist, that we might receive youth and young people as a gift from God. So we think about Jonathan and his young armour bearer and the gifts of, of boldness and solidarity. We could speak also of David, of Esther, of Mary, of Timothy, all young people looked down on because of their youth, yet faithful as young people, bold and passionate, perhaps sometimes foolhardy and rash, but clearly used by God for God's purposes. <clears throat> the church needs adults who will honour young people enough to hear their voices, adults who will trust God's work in them to advocate for their dreams and with the humility to learn from what young people have to contribute to us. There is a gift of adolescence. And you know, part of that gift is in the problems, the challenges that exist. Because there is something about the challenges of adolescence that draws out the care and compassion of adults. Adolescents come into our midst with all sorts of uh, uh, chaos and, and turbulence. And it requires adults to be around them with patience, with kindness, with compassion, with sympathy. And the gift of adolescence in the very challenge draws out this loving concern from adults. But there is also a gift in the very nature of this transitional time. In young people's capacity, they bring unique contributions to, well, to the life of the church, but to human existence. The idealism, the boldness. Young people who can help us navigate cultural change. As we reflected on uh, earlier with that first song, young people who are wrestling with the question of who they are and their identity. You know, it's said that the big uh, questions of, of adolescent experience, who am I? Where do I belong? What do I have to contribute? The, these <clears throat> questions that may not be articulated, but they're underlying pretty much everything that a, a, an adolescent is going through. These aren't just teenage questions. These are human questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? What, have I, what do I have to contribute? The thing is that young people ask those questions with sort of a ringing intensity because it, it sort of fills their vision because they're asking these questions for the very first time. When you get to be sort of 53, <laughs> the questions are still there, but we tend to just settle for the answers that we've come to. It's not necessarily a sign of maturity, but perhaps just a sign of making do. And young people come into our midst and remind us what is at the center of being human. Young people are a gift to be received. So I want to say to the adults, to the elders in this congregation, don't miss what God has for you in these younger disciples. Last week, Tracy set the challenge. You'll come back together next week in person. So keen to see and connect again with those people who are your friends. What would it look like to see and connect with those people who are different uh, to you and to connect with the young people and to hear what is on their heart, to see the needs that need to be met and to see the gifts that are there to be received. I want to say to the young people in this congregation, remember the words from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Don't let people look down on you because you are young. 
But don't forget the second half of that verse. Paul says, but set an example in speech, in conduct, in faith, love, and purity. And remember, God uses people just like you to advance his kingdom, to advance his mission. God uses people just like you to change the world. Essentially, what I'm saying in this sermon is, you are God's gift to the church. <laughs> Hold that idea wisely. <laughs> it's not a time to strut, but it's also not a time to cower in the background. Recognise all that God has given you in the Lord Jesus Christ and the filling of your spirit and stand and take your place in the life of the church. And connect with those adults that are willing to give that place for you and to advocate for all that you can bring as we seek to serve Jesus together. And Jack, let me say again to you, your job is to help these congregations serve these young people, the young people connected with this parish and the young people in the community beyond that these young people would have their needs met chiefly through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that these young people would have their contributions welcomed, that you would help to see young people enabled to take their place in the building of the church and sharing in God's mission. But of course you do that not to create a church that is centred on young people. Because the church is, doesn't just have the gift of adolescence, we also have the gift of childhood and adulthood, the gift of being an elder, the gift of infants, all with diverse needs to be met, each with unique contributions to bring, and in God's wisdom, united in one body so that the needs of one can be met by the contributions of others so that we would grow this community of mutual love and service, the sort of community that would echo the life of God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Youth ministry itself is not our vision. Instead, we look to the church united in ministry and mission, centred on the gospel, shaped by Christ and empowered by the spirit of the living God. I want to conclude with, uh, with one more psalm. We started in Psalm 78. Let me finish in Psalm 145. From verse 3. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. They will tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendour of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Do you hear all the verbs in those verses? The doing words. Telling, speaking, meditating, proclaiming, celebrating and joyfully singing. That's what they do. Who's the they? Who is the they in that passage? Who is it who is doing all this telling, speaking, meditating, proclaiming, celebrating and singing with joy? Well, it's in the line that I left out from verse 4. One generation commends your works to another. One generation to another. A, a, a community of people of all generations connected one to another. Elders to children, children to adults, adults to babies, babies to young adults and teenagers. Because we who are many are one body. We are all one in Christ Jesus. There is a gift to be received don't miss that gift that God has given us in his wisdom, in the Lord Jesus, in the power of his spirit. Amen.